By 1865, we knew what war was. By 1865, we had lost more than 750,000 of our finest young men, so many young men. This was a whole generation of future leaders that have been taken from us. continue with our American stories. A.C. Richards was the chief of police for Washington, D.C. in 1865. He attended a play called Our American Cousin at the Ford's Theater on Good Friday. But the chief wasn't there for the performance. He was there to see the President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, who the papers had announced would be there that night. But Richards saw more than just the president. He witnessed the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. The chief story is told by Mike Robinson, a reenactor who inhabits Chief Richards' experience to share with audiences the memories of that fateful night. Here is Mike Robinson as the character of the chief to tell the story of the assassination of America's greatest president. My name is A.C. Richards. I was a superintendent of Metropolitan Police from 1864 until 1878. You may address me as Chief. And I was in the audience that night of Friday, April 14, 1865. Would you be at all interested in what I recall from that evening? Yes. Well, the Washington you see today is much different than the Washington of my time. In fact, Charles Dickens came here in the 1840s and he said, Washington is a city of magnificent intentions. It has grand boulevards that start in nothing and go nowhere. <laughs> Indeed, we had not a single paved road. In fact, the avenue just down here, which was intended to connect the executive branch with the legislative branch, was unpaved. It was built on a floodplain, and every time it rained, it would flood out. In 1860, our entire population was a mere 75,000 people and none of us locked our doors at night. And then the war came, and our lives were changed forever. By 1865, our population had grown to well over 200,000 people, and we all locked our doors at night. The people who came here during those war years were pettifoggers and scoundrels. They were people trying to get something out of the federal government. I'm sure that's no longer true in your time, is it? But they required a great deal of entertainment, so Washington became a very exciting place to live. By 1865, we had over 3,500 saloons. If you did not like the Star Saloon on this side of Ford Theater, you could well go to the Greenback on this side. We had more than 400, how shall I phrase this, houses of ill fame. In fact, early in the war, one of the generals who was here liked to segregate all of the ladies of the night on the south side of the avenue. The general's name, by the way, was Hooker. We call that Hooker's Division. Indeed, those war years were very exciting years, and there was no more exciting time than that week in April of 1865. That week started with Palm Sunday, April 9th, 1865, when Robert E. Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia, and we started to think that perhaps this terrible time was finally ending. Now, I know that many of you in the audience think of our War of the Rebellion as a remarkably romantic period. Beautiful ladies in hoop skirts and handsome, brave young gentlemen in military uniforms. And indeed, we all enthusiastically marched off to war in 61. After all, this war would last for only three months, or so they told us. What fools were we? By 1865, we had all seen the elephant. By 1865, we knew what war was. By 1865, we had lost more than 750,000 of our finest young men, so many young men. 
This was a whole generation of future leaders that have been taken from us. There was hardly a household in the nation, north or south, that was untouched by mourning. It was a cruel, cruel war. So you can imagine how we felt that following Monday when we learned that Robert E. Lee had surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, there were still over 100,000 Confederates in the field, and the Confederate government had not yet been captured. Everyone knew that Bobby Lee had the most important army in the Confederacy, and we started to think that perhaps this was the beginning of the end. So a group of us Lincoln men, and I must admit, I was a Lincoln man then, I am a Lincoln man now, and I shall always be a Lincoln man. A group of us got together and we marched up to the White House to serenade the president. As we were singing, he came out on the balcony and we shouted, speech, speech. There was no one better speechifying than Abe Lincoln. And we expected something very special this evening. After all, he was the man who had led us through this terrible time. But old Abe, he hated to speak off the cuff. He told us if we would come back the following evening, he would be sure to have a few words prepared to say to us. Of course we did that. Well, I must tell you that he surprised us by what he had to say. It was not at all an inspirational speech. It was a very technical talk about how he would reunite the nation, what would come to be called Reconstruction. He said that he would emancipate all the slaves. Now that certainly surprised no one. As many of you know, in January 63, he had issued the Emancipation Proclamation which freed all the slaves in secession territory. And indeed, by February 65, we had passed the 13th Amendment. It had not yet been ratified, but we were well on the way to eradicating this terrible blot, the blot of slavery, which lay upon our Constitution. What he said in addition was that he felt that intelligent black men and those who fought for the Union cause deserve the right to vote. Now, he had certainly come a long way from the time when he was advocating colonizing all blacks outside of the nation. But upon reflection, it seemed only just. More than 200,000 brave black men fought for the Union cause. Two thirds of them were former slaves. They were fighting for their families, but they were also fighting for our country. Without them, we could not have won the war.